all about Kansas City. Like any work of art, you can't really understand the full depth of beauty until you understand the story. For so long, we haven't seen ourselves in the same light as this country's most beautiful cities. But the reality is, our city boasts some of the best examples of boulevard systems in America. Our downtown is a gigantic art gallery. We turned our back on Kansas City. We also turned our back on our greatest natural asset. The Missouri River. But things are changing now. KC Pride is everywhere. The people of this city are beautiful. From the shirt waist of Midtown to the rolling hills of Swope Park. The second largest urban park in America, by the way. We're going back to what matters. Back to nature. And back to the built environment. Back to beautiful. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to session two of Back to KC. Uh, my name is Brett Crawford. I'm the program director for Back to KC. Uh, let's hear it for Kemet and Will from Celestial who put that amazing video together uh, to kick off this session. So excited to see that come together. Kemet, amazing job. Uh, I'm gonna welcome Kemet to the stage here really quick with me. Kemet is uh, my coworker at Startland. He's the director of marketing and experiences and he's gonna be your session MC today. Um, Kemet, say hello. Well, I thank you, Brett, for that gracious introduction. And thank you all for being here at Back to KC Session 2, a.k.a. Back to Beautiful. I'm really excited to talk about what makes Kansas City the most beautiful city uh, in the world. And um, before we get started, I kind of wanted to um, talk a little bit about the platform we're on, because we didn't do that in the last session, okay. some of the things that you can do um, with Aramid. And uh, you have, you can see a few different buttons at the bottom. Uh, you can see where you can make reactions. You can do hand claps, thumbs up. Luckily, there's no thumbs down, so don't don't hate on us. <laughs> but there's also a chat uh, where you can uh, chat with folks. You can do direct direct chatting, and also you can see hover over um, people's names and see where they uh, where their location is, where they work. This is a platform for us to network. Um, although we can't do this in person, so just wanted to throw that out there. That's right. And there's a cool question feature on the side panel as well. Uh, there will be time at the end of the session for Kema and our panelists and myself to answer any questions. Uh, in addition, there are breakout rooms, which we hope you, we encourage you to use after the sessions. Uh, additionally, that will uh, kind of provide some of that uh, elbow rubbing that you would get at an in-person event. Um, but enough from me, Kemet, I will leave it to you and you can go ahead and introduce our wonderful uh, list of panelists. All right, we've got a lot to cover and I'm excited to cover it. So let's go ahead and get started. Um, first, I'd love to just briefly have our panelists uh, give their one sec, or not one second, <laughs> their one minute elevator pitch about who they are. Um, and I will uh, kind of brief or give everybody a bit of a preface first by saying, uh, I'm joined by my friend Phil Schaefer, a.k.a. Psych Style, founder of Psych Style Industries. Um, also joined by Carla Deal, uh, who is the owner of Squeezebox LLC and uh, Kansas City enthusiast and historian. Also joined by Krishna Lee, who's the athletics director for Kansas City, Missouri Parks and Rec. Um, great person to know if you want to rent any facilities and the, these beautiful facilities in Kansas City. Uh, and also Jay Tomlinson, the founder of one of the founders of Helix Architecture and Design. Um, and missing today is Kevin Klinkenberg, uh, who hopefully will join us soon. But first, uh, I'd like to start off with Phil, just um, let people know about you. Um, and then also, I, have, I think I had another 
follow-up question that I wanted you to, to say. Let me think about what that was. Oh, yeah. What's your favorite Kansas City landmark? There we go. So your elevator pitch and what's your favorite Kansas City landmark? All right. Thank you, Kemet. Hello, everybody out there. Uh, Phil Schaefer, a.k.a. Psych Style, is probably what you might know me as. Um, I've been in the Kansas City art scene for about 20 years now, a graduate of the Art Institute and a resident of Kansas City since 89. Um, you might know me from such murals as Wake Up and Live on the old Osco slash Cats Drugstore or the Mahomes mural on the side of Ale House or maybe the Urban Youth Academy down in the 18th and Vine District. So um, I consider myself a muralist, small business owner, an artist, you know, an appreciator of all urban culture. Um, and I thought long and hard about my landmarks and I thought about what I would see when I was driving around the city at night, finding my way in the, the, the big needle is what I called it on 31st street. And it was kind of like a beacon to say, okay, all right, you're south of where you need to be or north of where you need to be. Um, you could also see that coming over the uh, 35 um, kind of bridge that wraps around Kansas city. So you can see that from the distance and know, okay, we're almost home. So I like that um, area of town plus that beacon that kind of, says, oh, you're back to Midtown, you're safe, you're good. So that's one of my favorite little uh, icons. Yeah, I love that. Honestly, you know, my dad, I don't know, my dad ran this idea behind me or with me a few years ago and said like St. Louis has the arch, you know, that 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 gigantic antenna, whatever that thing is, could totally mm -hmm. be our arch if we marketed it right. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, so Jay, uh, we'd love to uh, let to let our audience know a little bit about you, and then what's your favorite Kansas City landmark? By the way, we, some people call that the Eiffel Tower. Um, yeah. a little bit of history. Right. I don't think it's a good name for it. Um, right. I'm an architect. I co-founded Helix Architecture and Design. Um, we've been here in the crossroads about going on 20 years. Um, so that's what I do. That's what my vocation is, but um, I've also, my whole adult career, um, involved myself in the Kansas City, especially the visual arts scene. Um, I served on the board and was chair of the board of the Charlotte Street Foundation, uh, an organization I, I'm sure you guys know about, who is very dear to me. Um, and I currently serve as treasurer uh, and on the board at the Kansas City Art Institute. So. Um, my life here in Kansas City has been about architecture and design and art and uh, rebuilding our urban core. Yes. And your so favorite. So the landmark. Yeah. Uh, uh, the first one I wrote down and then I thought of one as um, Syke was talking. Um, my first one is the South Lawn of the Nelson. You know, um, that has been a, a stage and a backdrop for my life and my family's lives um, ever since I came back after college. Um, it's just kind of my living room. I just, when we go out and we just want to go for a walk, uh, that's when we go. Yeah. Um, the other one I just thought of because of uh, the reference to the, the KCMO tower is uh, another tower. It's the um, formerly known as the BMA uh, building. It's at the corner of 31st and Southwest Trafficway, that tall white frame building designed by um, world famous Skidmore Rings and Merrill. That's a that's a landmark for me. That's kind of where I how I know where I am in the city. That's cool. That's cool. Okay, and that. Um, Krishna. Hey, everyone. Uh, my name is Krishna Lee. As Kimmet said, I'm the athletics director, uh, currently acting manager of recreation for uh, Kansas City Parks and Recreation. So the city itself, as opposed to any suburbs. Um, I'm born and raised here in Kansas City, uh, left for school and other adventures and was gone for about 10 years and came back in 2015 to, you know, settle down and you know, replant roots here, uh, reconnect with family and all that stuff. So it's uh, it's been wonderful, really, to to reconnect with a city that raised me, but it's so different. Like, it's, can't say enough. Uh, Sykes, when you said this, that tower, I was like, oh, man, I grew up not too far from there. So very much, like, I knew where I was in reference to that all the time. Um, but I'd say my favorite landmark, and this Took a lot of thinking, but the first thing that came to my head was the sky stations on Bartle. Mm -hmm. um, my mom worked for the convention center, retired from the city, and had 
some hand in getting those done. And so I remember her taking me down there um, when they were putting them on, like by helicopter and lowering them down on the pillars. Wow. And stuff, I'm thinking, oh man, that's really cool. Never at that point thinking they would be like such an iconic part of our skyline. So um, to have like been there the day they were put on and like feel like I have some sort of family connection to it, um, you know, coming in from the Kansas side, it's always a, a dream to see those. So, yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. Carla? Hey, what's up, Kansas City? I'm Carla Deal. Um, Kim had called me a Kansas City enthusiast. That's very true. I, uh, I fell in love with Kansas City history after I graduated with my MFA from UMKC. I uh, started writing long form essays on Kansas City history, which kind of morphed into this website blog called Squeezebox City. Um, I've been maintaining that since about 2013, but it's really kind of morphed into more of a, um, an experienced based entity. And uh, through Squeezebox and my you know, um, enthusiasm for Kansas City history, I, I published my first Kansas City history book last November. It's called Storied and Scandalous Kansas City, a history of booze, mischief, and corruption. And it's, uh, it's about a century worth of like the seedy underbelly look at Kansas City's red light districts, gambling districts, mafia, corruption, the Pendergast era. But um, I love, you know, turn of the century Kansas City history. And I think that a lot of what we see from today and what we're experiencing as the Kansas City residents today is because of 150, 100 years ago and what those people were doing and the urban planners were doing then. So I love to think about what our, you know, what we're doing today as a result on future generations of Kansas Cityans. So I think that this topic and this conversation we're about to, t to have today is a really critical one. Um, my favorite landmark is the Mutual Musicians Foundation by far. Um, I, you know, it's, it's not the, it's not the actual building that holds the kind of like um, landmark that we might see on like this in the skyline that we might all recognize or something. Uh, but it's the spirit of, I mean, it's one of the, nat it's a one of two national historic landmarks in Kansas City. The other one is the World War One Memorial. So it's a huge structure, uh, built structure. But this is like the spirit of Kansas City's most culturally important heritage, which is our jazz history and our jazz scene. So the foundation is like definitely my favorite landmark. Yeah, I totally agree. And I'm, I'm glad you guys took all the ones that I had on top of my, my list. Uh, the one that I was going to mention um, was the uh, Performing Arts Center, the Kaufman Performing Arts Center. Uh, it's definitely one of my favorite buildings. Uh, I know Moshi Softy uh, was, you know, designing or help or was the designer there. And I, I just remember the earliest sketches of that building. It was just, it looked like just sloshing over some sketch lines. And I was like, how is that going to become a building? And to see that, that really beautiful building come to life with the, with the, with the you know, the, the lions holding it and all the glass paneling and stuff, it just, and then the inside. So yeah, that's one of my favorite um, landmarks in Kansas City for sure. Um, so yeah, really uh, excited for this conversation. Um, let's kind of dive in here. Um, you know, unlike the other panels I've done in the past, I just kind of want to keep this uh, simple and just have a few different topics that we we talk about. Um, and, you know, the first one that I think we should touch on is the neighborhoods in Kansas City. Um, you know, there's so many different types of beautiful neighborhoods in Kansas City. We'd love to hear from uh, our panelists here on what their top neighborhoods are and what they um, what they like about them. So uh, I'd like to start with uh, with Jay on that one. Um, it's a great topic and a great question. Um, you know, what's inspiring me right now, um, in terms of neighborhoods are the ones that are rebuilding themselves. The ones, and I, all of my comments are going to be prefaced around the urban core, uh, when, when we're talking about Kansas City. Um, you know, I'm really excited and inspired by Beacon Hill right now. I, I see it really taking uh, root and I mean, it's been there a long time, but the city 15 years ago uh, started a redevelopment effort that's really starting to, to bear fruit. And so I'm, I'm really bullish about Beacon Hill. I've always loved the old Northeast. Um, it's a little more remote, but it's there and it's full of fantastic building stock. Uh, a lot of it's been renovated, but there's a lot of opportunity there too. So I'm really, I'm really expecting cool things in the old Northeast. And finally, uh, you know, it's a neighborhood that everybody knows and it's where I live and work is the crossroads. 
Um, I'm really proud of where it's come and I'm really excited about where it's going. I think maybe people could think that, well, the crossroads is done, but it's not. Um, and it's been, it's been improving regularly under the steady stewardship of um, community members within the crossroads to keep it authentic and to keep it accessible and to keep it arts oriented. And so, you know, I think all of these neighborhoods represent optimism and empathy. And uh, I think that's maybe not what you think about when you think about what neighborhoods represent. But to me, the optimism and the vigor and, the, and especially these days, the empathy that I think redeveloping these neighborhoods represents inspires the heck out of me. Yeah, I love it. But Phil, I know you're, uh, you've been a, uh, a um, midtown dweller for quite some time. Um, you know, I know you have an office downtown. Uh, any, any places in between there or outside of there that are, that are mm -hmm. your favorites right now? Oh, totally. You know, shout out to Squire Park. That's where my dad bought a house when we moved to Kansas City back in uh, 1990. And so, yeah. uh, and where is, for our audience who might not be familiar with these neighborhoods, can you, like, where is Squire Park? Uh, let's see. It's between Armour Boulevard and 39th Street, probably around Truce to Paseo. So you got uh, Tracy, Forest, or it's goes, you know, Forest, Tracy, Virginia, Paseo. So this is kind of my, you know, original neighborhood when it comes to me being a midtowner. Um, I migrated over to the Volker neighborhood when I was buying my first house or buying my house. And that neighborhood spoke to me because it reminded me of Flatbush, Brooklyn. Um, they had a laundromat down the street. I could walk to work when I worked at City Med Center at the time. Um, I could walk to Westford to the grocery store. So to me, that was one of the best walkable neighborhoods to live in in Kansas City. Um, and I love living there, and I still own a house there. Uh, my most recent favorite neighborhood now is the Luna River Market. I love shopping at the market, and it just seems to be really, I don't know, really vibrant with culture. There's a lot of um, different types of people there all the time, and so you kind of forget you're in the Midwest sometimes when you're seeing different food and different people around, um, which is fun for me. So I really appreciate the River Market now, and that's the neighborhood to me that's grown on me as much. Um, in the last few years. Yeah, totally agree on all of those choices. Um, all right, what about you, Carla? Well, um, I should also preface the way that Jay did and say that um, most of what I'm impassioned about is sort of like what a thing started out as and what it's become. So a lot of why I love certain neighborhoods has to do with how that neighborhood began and who founded that neighborhood. And my uh, top three favorite uh, Kansas City neighborhood from forever ago to present day um, are the West Side and the River Market and Columbus Park. And I tried to ask myself, like, why do why am I so interested in those three particular neighborhoods? And it's totally because those were the neighborhoods that housed the immigrant workers who built our cities, you know? So it's really, uh, it's really special for me to, you know, drive down those streets or walk down those streets and like, imagine who those people were that lived there and the fact that our city is anything that it is because of them. Um, so shout out to the immigrant communities who totally built the city. But my favorite neighborhood for sure is the West Side. That is a resilient, beautiful neighborhood um, that has overcome everything from, you know, a flood to the um, I-35 coming through and basically segregating it off from the rest of the city, which you know, basically made it kind of in shambles after that for a while. You know, the, the old mansions on Jefferson Street there that are still standing that were built like 150 years ago had seen glory. And then they were, you know, through the Depression and through the 50s kind of were became boarding houses. And then now they're all being renovated back to their beautiful grandeur. I just I love to see that a, that a neighborhood just stays stays true to itself, despite like all the challenges that it faces. And that neighborhood is, other than the um, Northeast, that neighborhood is, I, I think, the most culturally, ethnically, socio socioeconomically diverse neighborhood in the city still today. So, um, and it has some great damn food, you know? So. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. Uh, Krishna. Yeah, Los Alamos over on the west side. I will eat there every single day. <laughs> <laughs> um, but Carla, you... you uh, 
you know, you enjoyed these neighborhoods because of like what the immigrants built. And I'm in my favorite is going to be because of the great immigrant uh, community that's currently there. And I live in the Northeast. And part of the reason why I we bought there was because it was so culturally diverse. Like if I walk to the coffee shop, I can hear a couple languages. It does feel like I'm in a different place. Um, and there are people that look like me and there are people that don't look like me. And it's just, it does feel like, like nowhere else in the city. Um, I, I think we probably have the most immigrant owned businesses in that area. And honestly, uh, I'm not a statistician that is completely made up, but I feel like it's true. Um, the feeling of it is true for me. So um, that is like by far, like one of my, my favorite places to be is at home in my own neighborhood. So. Yeah, I totally agree. And, and I always forget to include myself in these questions, but probably my favorite neighborhood is um, off of, well, it's not necessarily a neighborhood per se, but we're Benton Boulevard, uh, like in the 30s, yeah, 20s, 30s, 40s, that, that whole pocket with those beautiful houses that are that line that street. Um, and Benton Boulevard's on uh, the east side. I'm trying to think of whatever the cross street would be. Um, but definitely take a look at some of those. There's actually a, lots of uh, great history over there. Um, and then the other neighborhood I was going to mention um, was uh, Beacon Hill as well. And I love Beacon Hill mostly because of uh, the, the, the rich history in Beacon Hill is amazing. It has some of the best vantage points uh, of Kansas City, of the downtown skyline that I've ever seen. Um, and then the, I love I love um, the history that, you know, that, that is the foundation of that neighborhood that's thriving now in, in the urban core. So that's, that's, that's mine, but I got a lot more others. We got to move on to our next question, which is about the green space and public space in Kansas City. And especially nowadays, you know, we're talking about times when there's a pandemic um, where, you know, a lot of times the only times we can gather safely is outdoors. Um, why is Kansas City, uh, what makes Kansas City a good place for, um, you know, riding out the pandemic? Jay, you want to tackle that one? Sure. Um, so I think it's, um, it's, a, it's a study in density, why we're a good place to ride it out. You know, um, I'll call it the Goldilocks density we enjoy here. It's not too dense and it's not not dense. You know, it's not New York where people are on top of each other and we've seen now what that has done with COVID. Um, but it's not, we're not so not dense that there's no place here. And so to me, it's we've kind of got the best of both worlds. We have all the culture and art of the big cities. I'll put it up against anybody. You mentioned the Kauffman Center, the Nelson, I mean, the a Negro Leagues Baseball Museum, World War, I mean, we just have a lot of culture here that, that makes it so easy to live here. Um, so I, I guess that's why I think we're kind of more COVID proof. And, I, and I'm sort of optimistic about the future because I think people are seeing, at least in the next five to 10 years, you know what, great density, the downside of great density. And I just think we've kind of got our Goldilocks density. It's not too dense and it's not too spread out it's just right yeah i totally agree with that and krishna being someone who's working at the parks and rec department uh here in kansas city and um I, my question for you is have you seen a rise in utilization of our public space or parks yeah absolutely and obviously we can't like get an exact number on that right we don't have people like taking <laughs> off who's entering and exiting the parks but um i mean i think we all probably saw um, once that weather changed early pandemic, like people were out walking, riding bikes, walking their dogs. Like I felt like everyone was outside. I went to Cliff Drive because uh, it's just down the street from my house a couple times a week. And there were significantly more people out enjoying the green space than usual. Um, you know, Kansas City, like the Parks Department envisioned Kansas City as like a city within a park. You said it earlier in the introduction that um, we have the second largest, you know, urban park in the in the nation with Swope Park. Uh, we have over 120 miles of trails, like 12,000 or so acres of parkland in the city, um, in Kansas City proper. Like we're not even talking suburbs, that's just like in Kansas City proper. So um, I think, you know, having the ability to take advantage of all of that green space, um, whether it be 
tennis courts or open space at Loose Park or, you know, sitting and looking over the river at Berkeley Riverfront. Like there's so many options and different ways to interact with nature here that um, it has been a great place to kind of ride out this here pandemic. Yeah. And you mentioned Cliff Drive and I'm glad you, you, you mentioned that. I want to I want to let Carla kind of explain the history of Cliff Drive. I don't want to put you on the spot, Carla, but I know you got it up there. <laughs> well, before I get to that, I just want to comment on like the activity of, um, you know, the pandemic. Like I felt like my family would just go sit on our lawn with some wine and like watch the families walk by and all of that. Um, and I really do want to comment too real fast before Cliff Drive came in about the City Beautiful movement because yeah. We had, and I know Jane probably can talk a lot about that too, but I mean, Cliff Drive and Paseo and all of our boulevards, you know, we had some really uh, strong proponents of the City Beautiful Movement, which was to beautify with statues and parks and boulevards and fountains. Um, you know, so we had like August Meyer and George Kessler and William Rockwell Nelson, and they came in and, you know, one of my greatest, like, metaphorical things I love to talk about in any kind of Kansas City lecture or history chat is the trees that grow that are so towering that were planted over a hundred years ago. That was like that was great vision of a of an urban planner to 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 grow the trees that they would not even um, enjoy in their lifetime. You know, so when you drive down Ward Parkway or you drive down the Paseo or you see any of these beautiful lined Brookside home you know streets or I mean you name it, go in any neighborhood you know, that was like the vision of, of, of people who wanted the future of, of Kansas City to, to thrive and be a beautiful place in which to live. Um, th there is a downside, obviously, to that, which, you know, when you are stripping away lots of acreage for these things, you are, you are destroying, you know, um, neighborhoods and homes that might not have as much historic or cultural relevance um, in the eyes of the planners at the time. So it's it's such a it's such a conflicting and interesting conversation. And Jay, I love I can't wait to hear like talking more about the urban plan that you see for the future of the city, because, you know, so many things have such a dark flip side when it isn't from the perspective of the sort of privileged class that will enjoy the beautification of, you know, these things. So I feel like that's a big topic on my mind as we're developing our urban core. Um, but Cliff Drive is insanely beautiful. There's like just limestone fossils dating back to pre, I'm talking like thousands of years ago. So that is definitely a, um, a place that if you haven't been, you need to go explore because you will see some geological history um, that you might not see in other parts of our city. Yeah, and it's one of the few scenic byways in America Yes. Um, literally at the, you know, at the very top of, and I mean, the vantage point to see in North Kansas City from Cliff Drive is beautiful. The drive, there's tons of like bike uh, races that happen during that, that go through there. It's you, when you come back, you got to check it out. Yeah. And talk about like a community that takes care of its own self. That's the historic Northeast, man. They yeah. will rally to uh, clean up any kind of, you know, any kind of messes in there, in there on Cliff Drive. Like, I'm just so impressed by the Northeast community, you know, Krishna, yeah. where you feel that, too. Yeah. Um, Jay, did you want to respond to Carla or uh, before I move to Phil? You mean about uh, where I see development going? Well, that's a separate question. Let's let Phil answer this one, and then we'll move to that. Sure. Yeah, Phil, so, you know, unless you have something in mind you want to talk about right now, I do have a question about you. We're kind of talking about, uh, you know, the natural side of Kansas City with trees, you know, you know, a green space and all that. When we talk about the built environment and what that could mean uh, as far as a communication tool, uh, as far as, you know, uh, addressing some of the things that we, uh, you know, deal with on a social side uh, and how art plays into that especially as your role as someone who's, uh, um, you know, where his art is on such display, how is Kansas City equip, um, how does Kansas City equip you to do, for you to, to, to do your work? So Kansas City has been the best place for me to ride out the pandemic because I haven't stopped working a bit. For better or worse, as a visual communicator, I think your job has been very secure this year because there's a lot to tell people. You gotta tell people where to stand, wear a mask, and also that you matter as well. And so 
um, I feel really bad for our brothers and sisters who work in the service industry and our performing artists because they were the ones that really got hurt this year. But I think the visual artists, if they were already doing something that had a message to it, this was year, year to shine. And this has been probably our best year on record. You know, love it or hate it, what 2020 was. It's, it's tough to talk about sometimes. Um, I spent my time in the park system, mostly eating Wednesdays and on my way to a different place to work. <laughs> you know, <laughs> pull into the uh, driveway at Loose Park with a, you know, BLT or maybe something from Ken Lynn and hang out with Holly before we went on to paint something else. And so we're really excited to look at the parks as the next area for, you know, art integration. And we've been doing some experimenting with that and we're you know, really excited to take our, take our 2D dimensions from vertical to flat. I'll just say that. And then also, you know, muralists have definitely, you know, transformed the city. And now this is all of a sudden a destination for murals and public art where, you know, when I started um, painting murals myself about seven years ago, it wasn't as saturated. You definitely had the OGs at it, you know, Alexander Austin and Scribe, who were, you know, my mentors in this game. Um, they did plenty of work. But when I started, you know, in Westport and I had no idea it would snowball to, you know, how what it is now. Um, and I just look at the future just thinking about design and craft. And so are we crafting our murals to be reflective of our neighborhoods? Are we crafting it so that we're kind of respectful to the architecture in the area? And this is a touchy subject because as someone who paints a ton of murals, do I think that there is a limit of how many murals the city needs? Yes. <laughs> but only because I like curation. I like things that are well curated and well designed. And I think when you have an abundance of things that do not make sense in an area, you'll end up with pushback. And we're quite approaching that time. But we yeah. are. Yeah, we are approaching that time. In the crossroads. So, yeah. Yep. We're all on the same page here. And so I think that it it comes really, I don't know, it, it's like a threefold thing because you have a ton of out of town developers. You have a ton of in town designers and architecture firms that are doing a lot of the work and you have the local artists to do it. And so I think it's up for the locals to really push into the out of town developers and say, this makes no sense. Let's do it like this. And I've been lucky to work with a lot of developers and a ton of my business is with out of town developers building new giant apartment buildings. And how do you keep them relevant to Kansas City? And you know, the piece that I did for say Columbus Park, it really doesn't speak to anything but color and light and a big logo that said Columbus Park Apartments, you know? And so that didn't really infringe on anybody's story because I wasn't trying to tell the story of Columbus Park in one year because you can't really do that. There's so many stories. And so I think that that was good that we just decided to go the abstract route. You know, for another mural in the River Market, um, I chose to work with a developer and just do like my psych style version of a Thomas Hart Benton crew. And that is their parking lot crew. So it's got a relationship to Kansas City, but it's got a psych style twist on it. You know, and another one has, you know, some horses that are being led by a zebra. So it's a psych style trip, but also kind of a shout out to the Plains um, and that, that, that. So I think Kansas City will be a great visual place to enjoy for years to come if you're walking around looking at public art, graffiti, and street art. Um, just looking forward to see how it's curated and really well done moving forward. Yeah, it's great to have someone like you, Syke, who's kind of being a steward of, you know, this burgeoning scene, uh, you know, really educating folks on the importance of curation um as it relates to public art um so yeah no it's hat, hats off to you thank you for all of your work um so our next uh, i would like to segue to uh, since we're kind of already talking about architecture how does the revitalization of downtown the surrounding areas impact kansas city's authenticity and history so um leading that question i'd like i'd like for jay to lead that one um and then i would also love to hear carla's um uh, response as well you know, I think our revitalization that we've been doing so far is definitely enhancing our authenticity. And, and here's why, from the 50s on to basically 2000, we were emptying out our urban core and all urban cores were emptying out. I sort of think it as, you know, the, we had this crown that was our downtown and the jewels started falling out. And, and uh, what was left 
was gaps in the city fabric from those buildings being torn down and parking lots being put in their place. And so uh, we lost our way in terms of authenticity, I think. And, um, but now I think we're, we're, we're coming back. And I think the infill that's going on, again, in the down, general downtown area, which I sort of refer to uh, what the downtown council calls the, the urban core, which is the river to 31st Street, um, State Line Road to, um, you know, 18th and Vine, or maybe even farther, a little farther than that. We're, we're infilling again, and that's the appropriate step. Parking lots and gaps in the, you know, jewels missing out of the crown was inauthentic. Filling that back in, and believe it or not, getting back to something like 1948 Kansas City, and I'm talking about downtown. No, I wasn't there, but I've seen the pictures. I've seen the pictures, and um, it was vibrant and vital and the place to be, and there was all walks of life, and there was commercial and there was residential. When we get back to that, when we've filled our last parking lot, at Helix, when we get to put a building in an empty in a parking lot, that's like the biggest pride point we can have because that's a step in the right direction. Absolutely. Yeah, um, uh, I, I love all of what you said. I mean, I think, you know, it was when you, I, I wish I could pop in some maps here, um, but like when you look at what was lost, you know, um, between the river market and like Quality Hill, when that interstate came through, the amount of beautiful, these aren't decrepit, these aren't buildings that were crumbling, they were lost to this way of modernity. But those people who put that highway system in there thought that they were advancing our community. And they thought that, you know, this is, this is again, always Right, I'll always to have the checks and balances, even on yourself, for what will be the like long, like long view consequence of what we're doing. And um, I think obviously, like you know, rebuilding the density and refilling in some of the places in Helix, you are you know doing doing good work. Um, you know, our downtown is extraordinary. The Art Deco historic architecture is is i mean you know you talk about going to st louis or all these other you know cities and, and the kansas city is one of the most beautiful um skylines from north south east and west however you look at it and for me it's the historic architecture but it's also these new funky modern structures that are popping up that just almost are like art pieces um in and of themselves which i think is a really special thing um, I, I worry, so I've been a long time East Crossroads property owner, 15th and Oak, and lived there for many, many years. I recently mm -hmm. moved from the neighborhood, but we are, we were, for a long time, we were neighbors. Um, so even in my small, pardon? I'm at 15th and Walnut, we're neighbors. Right, we definitely are. Um, but even in my, we're you know, yeah, now Phil's your neighbor, because he's there. <laughs> but um, I, I just, in the amount of time that I lived there, I firsthand, this isn't, this isn't, um, you know, like, philosophizing. This is firsthand witness of like my art friends and my, you know, people kind of leaving the crossroads. What is, what is going to, um, Jay, what will it take to sustain the very essence and spirit of that neighborhood that we all love so much and people travel in from out of the city to come visit? What will it take to sustain that, but also continue this rapid development of these large scale apartment buildings and why are there so many churches coming in? Yeah. <laughs> it's a question. I'm not touching that one. <laughs> so, um, but, um, what what do we do? Uh, we you know Crossroads was um, a way station for goods that came off the trains back in the you know 100 years ago. It was it was a light industrial place, and then in the 70s and 80s, the artists started fertilizing it and, and grabbing these old spaces. And that's what most Kansas Cityans think of as the crossroads now, is that arts community. So what do we do? We make sure that we honor and um, bolster and support the arts. And I'm talking about all the arts now, not just the visual arts, mm -hmm. with every step we make in the crossroads. And it's hard to do especially when you're talking to somebody from out of town maybe that 
has the money to do something but doesn't understand the uh, the uh, you know who we are. So it's hard work. It takes locals that are you know on the ground um, to be involved in their neighborhood associations, ready to roll up their sleeves and just and fight for talk about authentic. Fight for what's authentic. You know I. I editorialize a smidge. I thought First Fridays had gotten terribly inauthentic. Mm -hmm. um, and I was really, well, I was very sad when that um, murder happened that caused us to all step back and take a breath. And then, the, and then the, the pandemic piled on. I feel like it's a great chance for us to reset what First Fridays are. I don't want them to go away. The neighborhood doesn't want them to go away. But they need to be more authentic. And we'd gotten away from what they were, which is with time places for people that were interested in the arts to come together and look at art and talk about art and buy art so that's my little soapbox on crossroads yeah it's not just a food truck rally no uh, it's not exactly. even a food truck rally exactly go to the restaurants no. <laughs> it's totally true you know i used to sell t-shirts on the corner of 19th and uh baltimore in the front of the Dolphin Gallery when it was there where Farina is now. Yeah. And it was in 2006. That was ground zero. Huh? That was ground zero, that and the Lady Gallery. Yeah, so I remember in 06, you know, I made a deal with the Dolphin Gallery that I could sell t-shirts out front and, you know, would just kind of do my sock style thing there. And then I couldn't even imagine how it would have exploded to people just selling trinkets and, yeah. you know, odd things on the side of the street. So. Um, I think the artist being a part of the community is the best way that this is going to happen. If we're still here, like I'm still here, and I tell this to people, it's like, yeah, I was able to stay here, and I know a lot of artists lost spaces this year. They're coming back in different places. But as artists, we've had to move from the West Bottoms, to Midtown, to the Crossroads, to the Northeast. This is what we do, so there's nothing new. So when people are like, oh, no, we're losing, yeah, you lose one building, three more open up, you know, down the street. Or we're artists are creative and we're resourceful to find things that happen. Um, so I'm really fortunate and happy that I'm still in the crossroads and can have a voice and use my voice. Uh, but hopefully the people who move in next will understand, you know, hey, I'm here. And I think it's up to us to say, hey, like, you know, we're the ones you talk to if you want to, you know, do something. So, yeah. Excellent points here. I'm loving this conversation. We are running out, a little bit out of time. I wanted to invite all of our attendees to ask questions. Um, that we can answer uh, at 1.50 p.m. We're going to answer the, answering those questions. Um, before we head to the Q&A portion of uh, the panel here, I did want to ask Krishna one last question about the parks in Kansas City that are being underutilized and why they should be more utilized. Is there any parks that you can think of that are just usually vacant that could, you know, could use more people? You know, that's a that's a really good question, Kemet. And um, as you know, because we've had multiple conversations, um, you know, sometimes we don't, we don't, we're not there every day. We don't have people in the parks every day. That would, we have 221 parks. Like, there's no way. Um, yeah. So, like, to a certain extent, we don't know um, always, like, what is being utilized if people aren't, like, visiting our website and reserving stuff and things like that. It's all kind of hearsay and speaking to the neighborhoods around to know um, what that park utilization looks like. But I will say, um, you know, in the, in the last, well, since our, since we changed directors uh, almost two years ago, there's been a, a heightened um, kind of sense of urgency towards uh, social equity within our park system. Um, and, and looking at the parks that are, in kind of like the five zip codes that are not, that have like the lowest life expectancy. Um, so call those our LifeX zip codes. And um, we actually just started a new division that will focus specifically on those and giving those parks the sort of resources that they need to um, to kind of come back and, and be revitalized and get the love that they need so that we can get the people out and enjoying them that, you know, want and need to be there. So. Um, I think we're on our way, but if you guys, you know, like you said, if you uh, have ideas, like we're always open to ideas. Kim is throwing me a, a number of ideas about some skating rinks. Uh, which I'm down for like I, I get myself some uh, some wheels for sure to get out there with them. Um, but we're, my we're secrets. Open. 
You're right. So, so if we can get more people out there. We want to. We want people to be able to enjoy those spaces because they're for all of us. And and painting them in a way that lets everyone know that they're welcome, um, regardless of who you are, is our, one of our top priorities right now. Yeah, and one of the other thing, interesting things about parks is a lot of people, especially parents, consider parks places for their children to play. Mm -hmm. It seems as though the parks department here in Kansas City has stepped their game up as far as saying, like, this is a place for you too. Yeah. <laughs> Not just for kids. And here's some things that you can do, uh, you know, while your kids are, I mean, parks, are, since the pandemic, like, this is, the parks have been one of my favorite parts about Kansas City, just being at, able to, you know, be in a safe environment with my kids and being active and outdoors is awesome. You and me uh, both. Can I make a quick plug for a park real fast? That's like yeah. just so cool that I love so, so much. It's the Caw Point, uh, mm. the Lewis and Clark historic site on the other yeah. side of the river. So if you're gonna take your kids, take the family. I mean, it's a supremely cool, beautifully like done um, park that, you know, pays homage to, you know, Lewis and Clark who put our place on the map hundreds of years ago and yeah. it's just you're, you're on the banks of the Kaw or Kansas River it's a different experience than you're going to have in any other park so you can put in there. The what's that you can put into the Kaw there and you know put exactly. your tank kayak and get in and go I was I, just going to mention that I did that this summer and it was what? great and as someone that works for the Kansas City Missouri Parks and Recreation <laughs> yeah. System and not the unified government of <laughs> Wyandotte County and KCK I love that park yeah, yeah, yeah. We connect them all. We can connect our riverfront. Yeah. 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 So there's lots to discuss here. This could go on and on and on. Um, we do have a couple <laughs> questions in the queue um, from Adam Arandondo. What's up, Adam? Uh, Carla, <laughs> Carla, what is the most interesting piece of KC history that most of us don't know about? Well, I love like the riverfront community um, that first started out here, like the, the called kind of the French community along the river. Nobody really knows that, you know, that was like a, you know, built just like sticks and shacks kind of place where the French kind of settled and started a fur trading community. But even beyond that, just right there on the river banks, I mean, that's where the gambling district was. That's where the red light district was. So that you know, whenever you go visit um, the park that's down there right now, you are walking on just the like beginning backbones of the city there. So um, more research about that is always like fun to do. But that the French community that started there, you know, it was a, a really vibrant thing. They would have potlucks and bring in the Indian tribes around. They would have music, singing, jam sessions. It was like a, a really robust community without even a city behind it. So, yeah. I love you know, that. Are there any images uh, available? People can see any of that stuff? Um, not, not like, you know, there's like sketches, you sketches, know, like, right. uh, character sketches. Um, or maps, maybe? What's that? Any maps, maps or anything? Oh, yeah. I mean, the Missouri yeah. Valley Special Collection, go on to kchistory.org and search French, just search French, and it'll come up with all kinds of images. So, cool. Awesome. Um, let's see, we've got a question from Brian Johnson, um, and it, he says, it seems to me from my travels that great cities like NYC and Paris, et cetera, all focused a majority of their attention on the sidewalks. Sidewalks seem to be a, fo a focal point of the architecture. Is this a thing that we see as part of our beauty? Uh, Jay, you can tackle that one. Well, yeah, um, um, gosh. Uh, where to start? Um, our sidewalks uh, need need some attention. Um, they are, uh, you know, they're the paths that let us walk by and see all the beautiful things that are happening. And that in a walkable city, which we're headed towards, at least our urban core, we're making really good strides. And our sidewalks are terribly important. And the, and the trouble is, and this is a plug and a shout out to my colleague at Gould Evans, Dennis Strait, who has been studying um, the um, lack of density and the sprawl that Kansas City, Missouri represents and trying to maintain all that 350 square miles that we own is really hard. One of the first things that gets injured or left behind is sidewalks. And so it's just gonna be block by block. And when, it, when, a, when a block gets redeveloped, we, the city's doing a pretty good job of making the developer focus on the sidewalks, but there's more to do. Um, because in 20 years, 
we're going to be a lot less car oriented than we are. And we're going to be mo much more interested in other forms of transit and modalities and uh, sidewalks are going to be the core of it. We should, we should in the urban core start looking at streets that we could eliminate in favor of promenades that you can walk on. Think of them as wide sidewalks. Mm -hmm. Fully support that. That is awesome. Yeah. Walk the street first. I vote. <laughs> I dig it. So off top, before we go to our next question real quick, 10 second answer. Anybody have a favorite sidewalk in Kansas City? I know the plaza has some good examples of sidewalks. That was what came to mind only because, you know, they're well maintained for a reason, right? Like, yeah, yeah, exactly. You know, I, I have a favorite sidewalk. Um, it's in the west side, but it's in that part that Carl was saying that was cut off by the highway. It's on Washington Street, I think. And it's it's a really old sidewalk, and you can tell it's got this gorgeous patina. You could see the, the pebbles that were in it. And in it, there is a, a bronze little a marker that whoever made the sidewalk put in it that just said, you know, 1896 Shaw concrete or whatever it was. But it just said so much about the history of the place. And so it, it's not a very well kept sidewalk, unfortunately, but it's just full of history. If you'll just look down and sort of pay attention. Yeah. And I love seeing the old, uh, the, the street names and some of the older sidewalks too. Uh, I know there's some on Truce, Paseo. Yeah. Um, yeah, those are really cool to see. Um, cool. Uh, we've got another question from, oh, my good friend, Carly Erickson. How you doing, Carly? Mm -hmm. um, if we're suffering from moral fatigue, what are some other good examples of incorporating art into the built environment? Psych? So is this the already built environment or the to be built environment? So I got things. I don't think that it's necessary to cover every piece of historical brick with murals. Buildings who have survived the wear and tear and have that patina and have that nice look to them, I think if they're just kept well and you keep the old historic bricks and you know surfaces together, that's totally fine. Um, there are several buildings that kind of, you know, Add to that, like stuff that was built in the 70s or 60s, they use a lot of the more flat architectural surface and it lends to a big surface. So, you know, I think that gosh, you could do so many things, like projections, for instance. You don't need to paint it. You could do something that's temporary. You could do rotating uh, galleries that have um, installations on them. So you, you build a billboard that's attached to a building, you know, and then you could move in the artwork and it comes and goes. You can do window displays. I think if Kansas City wanted more places to walk, you know, you would do better things at the windows. So people would be like, oh, let's go see all the window displays on this street and the crossroads. Yeah. Um, there's a, yeah, a lot to do besides just murals. But yes, more murals would be okay or cool signage as well. So if, you know, there is um, ways in which, you know, maybe it's, you know, I don't know. There's probably, there's not a lot of ordinances against signage. Kansas City is actually really, you know, okay with it. So hand painted signs, I think are great as well. So um, my things would be like, you know, look for the temporary and the, the movable, like, you know, things that could change over time to, you know, supporting craftsmen and doing like handmade pieces that you want to install on something that also has to do with um, hand painted signs or small sculptures. And also just think about what you're going to say in the window displays that you could see as you're going by. So those are top three things I think about. Off the top of my have you guys seen the manhole covers in Seattle? Not in a while. There's not time to talk about them, but check them out. It's art in manhole covers. Nice. Oh, they were commissioned like that. There was a, a call yeah. to artists and the artist designed them. I I remember, yeah, I remember seeing that. Hey, shout out to the streetcar DC for the art that they wrap their cars in. I mean, that's yeah. beautiful art. Every time I see the streetcars going up and down, rewrapping something new, I'm like, okay, that's the direction, right? Like, think about that. That's mm -hmm. amazing. So. Yeah, no, I love that. And one of the other things I was going to say, uh, Phil, about different ways outside of murals uh, is with light. And mm -hmm. I love what the downtown Kansas City skyline does like the, those different building owners are in conjunction with different uh yeah. themes you know because like who makes that call but someone's like hey everybody it's red friday <laughs> i think there's you an know? email thread <laughs> so, yeah. well, kansas city. that is so kansas city hey guys what what color do you feel like tonight I right. love it's, it's like, alternating I between red and sporting blue right now which is good 
but the also the uh, the Children's Mercy Research Tower has opted in on that as well. Nice. And so they are now like fully green and red or whatever color they need to be. And you know, I, I thought that was cool when I heard about that building design. They said they wanted to make sure that they were going to tie in that area with downtown and show their colors for whatever the season is as well. Yeah, that's smart. Yeah, I mean, there's just the sky's the limit when it comes to any of this type of stuff. And any, are you attendees? Like you guys can have an impact on what any of this stuff looks like in Kansas City um, if you, um, you know, have an interest in reinvesting in, in Kansas City. I know for a fact, me as an artist and uh, as, you know, someone who's interested in the built environment, I was able to uh, convince the Power and Light building to turn a certain color to match the color scheme for my album release, you know? And so cool. for like 24 cool. hours, I get to say like, that's the, that's the biggest art installation in Kansas City. Like that's <laughs> me. <laughs> um, so yeah, there's so much you can do here. And you know, this topic is something near and dear in my heart. So um, let me see if we have any more questions. I know we had one last question about um, improving the green space in Kansas City in the last 20 years. You kind of talked on that. that um, Krishna, do you, or Krishna or Jay or anyone, do you guys want to touch on any of that? How the green space has improved uh, in the last 20 years? Carla? I just want to say, you know, I saw a rendering for, uh, and I don't even know if you can, you can, you can school me on this, but the rendering for the, a green space entirely over, through the downtown right there. On the top of The lid over I-6. I I mean, can we not have that? That is extraordinary. I want that. I'll commit to staying here for the rest of my life and making my community <laughs> pay for it if we get that, because that would be... Pinky swear. Pinky swear. I I'm, totally here agree. I'm here for it. <laughs> uh oh, Dad's here. <laughs> hey, kids. Uh, oh, good. Um, we are unfortunately coming up on our time uh, for this session. I know, I know. We can sit here and talk this all day. This has been a really awesome conversation to uh, to be a part of and to watch you brilliant minds uh, have in front of our very eyes. Um, I do want to encourage everyone that's in attendance. Uh, once we kind of. I think I'm going to pause the session and then you're able to go out into the lobby and join a breakout table. Uh, I know I think most of our panelists are able to join in on that. I think a couple have hard stops at 2 p.m. So I'm trying to be uh, weary of everyone's time here, but um, I'll be around. I know Kemet will be around, a few other people. Uh, thank you so much, Kemet, Krishna, Jay, Carla, Syke. It has been really awesome to get to uh, watch you all speak about Kansas City's uh, beautiful, beautiful, beautiful nature and uh, all the things that we are lucky enough to have as a part of our city and all the things that we hope to see in the future. Uh, so thank you all for being here and for being a part of Back to KC 2020. Um, like I said, I'll be in a uh, breakout room, happy to talk with anyone, and uh, we hope to see you at our next session at 4 p.m. We'll be diving into Back to Creativity, talking about our food and music scene, as well as some other really awesome aspects of Kansas City, and I hope to see you all there. So I'll talk to you soon. See you Thanks, later. everybody. Yep, see ya. Be safe. Thanks. Yeah, you too.